Hi, and welcome to the Stefan Levera podcast focused on Bitcoin and Austrian economics. Today, I've got an interview with Alex Bosworth. But first, let me introduce the sponsors of the show. So firstly, Kraken. Seriously impressive Bitcoin exchange, one of the longest standing with a really strong focus on security that consistently rated the best, high trading volume and low fees with no minimum or hidden fees. Kraken have 24-7 support and if you're working with a business, they're providing best-in-class accounting, reconciliation and reporting services for cryptocurrency hedge funds, asset managers and fund administrators. Kraken also have an OTC desk for large block trades. They offer five fiat currencies and they also offer margin and futures trading. To learn more and sign up, go to the Kraken link in the show notes. This episode is also presented to you by Unchained Capital. Unchained Capital is a Bitcoin financial services company that empowers customers with unprecedented financial freedom and control. All of their products and services are built on the foundation of multi-sig and their approach to collaborative custody gives users control over their private keys as well as the benefit of a financial partner and financial services. Unchained's two of three vaults are a great option for those thinking about how best to secure their Bitcoin for the long term. And if you ever need to access liquidity but don't want to sell your Bitcoin, Unchained's collateralized loans offer a unique option. All Bitcoin is stored on-chain in dedicated multi-sig addresses, and the Bitcoin is never rehypothecated. You can also share in the security of your Bitcoin by holding one of three keys. I've been really impressed with Unchained. They offer excellent services. They've released valuable content and open source tools with more to come. I think you'll enjoy partnering with them, so learn more at unchained-capital.com. Check out Cypher Wheel by Cypher Safe. Are you keeping your Bitcoin seed backed up in a way that's fireproof, waterproof, rustproof, pet proof, and tamper evident? If not, look into Cypher Wheel. It's a new product. It comes in a wheel shape that masks the words of your seed unless you actually open the tamper evident seal. So make sure you have your Bitcoin seed backed up to help you in case your paper seed backup gets waterlogged, tampered, or goes up in a fire. And with the Cypher Wheel, you can ensure that either you or your loved ones have access to your Bitcoins if an accident occurs. This is particularly Particularly important if you're in a single SIG situation. The product is available for pre-order. Check out the website, cyphersafe.io. The link is in the show notes. Okay, so I just got back from the Lightning Conference in Berlin, and I actually had the opportunity to co-MC that event alongside Des Dickerson from Lightning Labs. It was an incredible event. There was just such a great energy in the space and I had the opportunity to meet so many of the stars of Lightning Network. So big thanks to Jeff and the team, everyone involved with organizing that. It really was an amazing, incredible event. So for our guest today, as many of you know, Alex Bosworth is Lightning Infrastructure Lead at Lightning Labs, and he's well known for his mind-blowing Bitcoin and Lightning insights, as well as the products and things he's building, such as Submarine Swaps and Yols.org. So in this interview, we talk about Submarine Swaps, Loop In and Loop Out, And the implications of this for the Lightning Network, such as enabling merchants to rebalance their channels to get more incoming capacity, or for users to refill their spending capacity. So here is the interview. Alex, welcome to the show. Hi, it's great to be on the show finally. Yeah, I've been uh, meaning to get you on for a while and uh, you know, now we're finally making it happen. So uh, look, just I guess for the context of the listeners, we are recording this one in person just before the Lightning Conference, the inaugural Lightning Conference. Uh, so just a couple of days before, there was a Lightning Meetup last night. Uh, it's been fantastic to meet a bunch of the people around uh, Bitcoin and Lightning. What was your experience like last night? Yeah, there's a huge amount of people coming out for the Lightning Conference. Like, I guess this is the inaugural Lightning Conference. So, um, you know, it's way oversold. There's like a bajillion speakers. So it's I think it's going to be a good event. Fantastic. Yeah, so look, so today I was keen to get into some topics around submarine swaps, loop, hyperloop, as I know you've been doing a lot of work on these lately. Can you start with a bit of a background? I think most people know who you are, so uh, we can just sort of jump into it. Uh, If you wouldn't mind just giving us a bit of uh, background on submarine swaps and how they work for Bitcoin and Lightning. Uh, Yeah, so um, I uh, initially was working at um, a company called BitGo, and um, I, I was working on Lightning integration there. And, you know, one of the things that we really were thinking about and that I was thinking about is, like, we've got this totally new system, Lightning, and but everybody's really already, like, 
uh, hooked up to the the regular blockchain. They're like familiar with the blockchain. Um, so one thing I was thinking is like we need some way to link these two together. And submarine swaps is a way to um, link the the blockchain, what you're like regularly used to, um, with the Lightning Network. So you can make a payment in Lightning, and then it, it basically forwards onto uh, the blockchain in a way that's non-custodial. So uh, it uses the same principle that Lightning payments use, which is HTLC, the con- HTLC contract, um, but in a very simplified way. Um, so uh, I. I started working on that independently outside of BitGo um, at this uh, website, submarineswaps.org, which is an open source project to like make a submarine swap server and kind of demonstrate the concept. Um, and as I worked on it more, I realized that there's another, there's, there's all sorts of use cases that in addition to this bridging of old world to new world um, that relate to like capabilities. So, um, the capabilities of Lightning are somewhat limited in terms of if you need to uh, move capital around. In Lightning, you're constricted by the existing channel capacities of your peers. So money can't really be introduced or even really exit the system because you are locked into these channels um, that you created a while ago. And so the idea is that we reuse them all the time. But if you want to uh, move the capital around in, in, in a way that uh, is outside of the limits of those capacities, then you're going to need another mechanism. And one of those mechanisms could be the blockchain. Um, so I worked on submarine swaps for um, Litecoin, um, Litecoin to Bitcoin. Um, so I offered different pairs. And um, that the, the direction that I implemented submarine swaps was um, to go from on-chain to off-chain. So the idea would be you could just make a regular on-chain payment with any kind of wallet, and that payment could pay any Lightning invoice that you wanted to. Um, and then if it can go cross-chain, so you could use even Litecoin to pay a Bitcoin Lightning invoice. Um, so then after I worked on that that project, um, and that's, that's released, you can go check that out, um, I joined Lightning Labs. And at Lightning Labs, uh, we... Uh, worked on a similar project for submarine swaps, which is called Lightning Loop. Um, but this time, we we made it go in the other direction to solve a different kind of problem. And the problem that we're solving with Lightning Loop initially was um, that there's an issue where people want to get inbound liquidity so that they can receive. Um, or if you're a router, you want to be able to uh, route payments. You need some capital going into you and some capital going out of you. Um, but the way that uh, Lightning works is that if you make channels with somebody, the capital is only going from you out initially. So um, Lightning Loop is a way to kind of get that started, to jumpstart that process. Because what you can do is you can say, I'm going to make a Lightning payment out, and then I'm going to receive the same funds back on chain. And because I've spent down my channel, I can now in the future receive on that channel. Um, so that's something that we released a while ago. And um, since then, we've also added the ability to go from on chain to off chain as well. Right, yeah. So I guess uh, listeners, check out the earlier episode with Yost Yaha as well from the team where we spoke about uh, loop in and loop out. And I guess just to recap the understanding there, you can open a channel with somebody, but because we're single funded and because I'm opening the channel, that is all the balance, all the beads in that abacus are on my side and there's none on the other side. So I've got no, no incoming capacity from that other person until I pay through that channel. And then only then I've actually got incoming capacity and then so what you're, you're saying here with sub use of submarine swaps is we can use that to change what's in that channel because we're using an on-chain payment as our other way of moving money uh, across that channel if you will yeah i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't also place the blame on single funded channels it's yeah. it's kind of a fundamental principle of lightning that Somebody needs to commit capital in some direction. So it always makes sense that um, you can't just go to somebody and for free demand that they commit capital in your direction because they don't have unlimited Bitcoins. Um, so the idea is that you can um, you can uh, re- rebalance your channel um, in a way that fundamentally changes the flow properties. Um, and that's, uh, that's impossible just using the Lightning Network by itself. Right, yeah, and I think that's also capturing, I think you've explained it 
as stock to flow as well, right? That there's the flow of incoming payments. So, for example, if I'm a merchant and I've got all these channels and then at the end of the day, let's say a lot of customers bought stuff from me, so all of my incoming capacity is now exhausted because they were paying to me, then one way to sort of push it back out is to use a submarine swap. And so in that example, you would push the you know the beads in that abacus to the other side and receive the bitcoins back in an on-chain payment and so i guess that's what a submarine swap would help the merchant achieve in that example and i guess that would be a loop out in that scenario that's exactly right and that's one of the big use cases that we really thought about and we did loop out first so that you can push the balance of your channel locally out back onto the chain and um it's kind of a complement to the internal mechanic of lightning which is rewarding forwards by giving you fees so in theory if you're a good merchant you're getting regular amounts of traffic the people who are forwarding the traffic to you are getting paid in fees and so in theory they should be also monitoring that that flow and say oh well i i just made a bunch of money in fees sending to the store so i should continue to uh assign more liquidity in that direction but you're really depending on them to notice that. And, you know, maybe they're not anticipating you're doing something that's, you know, new, or maybe you're just getting started. So they haven't built up that reputation yet. So loop out is a kind of way to take matters into your own hands. Right. Yeah. Let's talk about the loop in example. So I think uh, maybe an example here would be, I want to pay on chain and then receive it into my lightning balance. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, like one thing to think about with these, you know, with this mechanism of continually adding capital as it gets depleted is that there's always one side who's sitting on this capital and uh, they might not really want to sit on endless supplies of capital. So like, let's say I'm a mobile wallet and I create a channel to a routing node and it's $100. And then when I spend down my entire $100, well, what am I going to do? I, you know, I want to spend more money, so I create a new channel that's another hundred dollars. And let's say this goes on for maybe a year or multiple years, and the the money isn't flowing back. It's it's just sitting on that other side. So the peer is maybe not so happy about this situation. They're just getting money that's collecting on their node, and because if I'm a mobile node, if I'm not a routing node, um, that money is not really doesn't have the same utility to them to spend out to the rest of the network. They can't just offload that to an exchange. So the thing that we're thinking about with loop in is to make it friendlier to your peers to say, we're going to reuse this channel. So uh, instead, what you're going to do is you're going to create this $100 channel to your peer. And then when you've when you've run that down, when when that's completely exhausted, you can do uh, one on chain transaction, which is the loop in and you can go you can go from your exchange into the loop in on chain and then loop the loop server will send you back the funds off chain and then your peer is happy with you that you're not continually adding more capital to them that they have to now protect in their hot wallet right yeah that's a that's a really good point because for every person let's say you're a merchant you're a service provider you are running lightning you've now got to consider that you're keeping more in a hot wallet so that's one of the costs of using lightning and so you don't want to unnecessarily impose a cost there and i think t the other point you brought up is that if you are just a mobile phone uh, lightning user and if you just continually open a new channel each time then you just end up accumulating all these utxos that are just sitting there whereas in this model it's actually more efficient because you're just reusing the same utxo and you're and you're imposing less of a chain fee cost onto the service provider in this case, because let's say if you didn't have some kind of loop in or loop out, or in this case, loop in, then that the service provider in this case would have to close the channel and open a new one. Right. And that's, again, these are all chain fees. So yeah. Although every loop still does involve a chain fee. So right. um, there's ways to, one thing that we're working on in the future is to also create like um efficiencies around uh aggregating these multiple balance shifts and um in that case then we can we can get some efficiency there and you know if i'm talking about like being efficient to appear i don't mean like just being nice to people i mean like just from a cost perspective they're going to have to reflect that cost back onto you so what we're trying to do is to just make it cheaper right yeah yeah because i guess fundamentally it just comes down to how many on-chain fees are you doing or on-chain uh, fees are you incurring and then 
what are some ways to batch and aggregate those such that you are reducing your on-chain footprint? Right. And it's it's really for, you know, thinking about once we get into full blocks, once we get into higher fees, um, just getting the most savings so that you don't really have to think about as much, you know, being efficient with your chain fees. Got it. So let's talk a little bit about some of the, I guess, limitations of using submarine swaps. So one example there might be uh, that you have to wait for on-chain confirmations. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a shock even doing a submarine swap because, you know, if you really get into the lightning mode, you get used to it that just everything settles very quickly and you're not waiting for 10 minutes or 20 minutes. Um, But once you get into submarine swap mode, then you fundamentally have to wait for this on-chain settlement. Um, I mean, there's ways that we can kind of uh, take shortcuts around it. But I mean, the fundamental principle of the blockchain is that uh, there's some weight, some weight involved, there's some proof of work that has to happen. Um, so yeah, the that's kind of like the one of the downsides to going into submarine swaps. And in addition to the chain fee. Yep. And I think in one of your talks, you're also mentioning how there is some privacy implication as well, because the submarine script, the Bitcoin script is observable on the blockchain. Yeah, I mean, there's like privacy pros and cons with submarine swaps. Um, One nice thing about a submarine swap is, um, let's say that you're doing like a loop out. That's where you pay off chain to the loop server, and then the loop server pays on chain for you. So normally when you make an on chain transaction, you link one of your UTXOs to your spend. Um, But with a loop out, your UTXO that you're spending is like connected to some channel somewhere. And you're using that channel then to to pay to the loop server, and the loop server makes the payment out from the loop's own UTXOs, from the loop server's UTXOs. So if you actually just look at the chain, there's no longer that link there. And even the loop server has no idea, because of the Lightning Network's privacy guarantees, it has really no idea who pay, whose UTXO was associated with paying the loop server. So there's some privacy wins in that case. But there are also privacy issues where... If you analyze the blockchain, you can see these special loop submarine swap scripts. Um, and also different swap service providers use different types of scripts. The service, the scripts that we use at Lightning Labs is, are different from the scripts that I made when I made the initial implementation of submarineswaps.org. Um, and, you know, there's other wallets who have imp- implemented their own submarine swaps. So there's, you know, a lot of tags on what you're u- using, what you're doing. Um, and that's something that we want to improve. We want to get rid of those those scripts, uh, those script markers on chain. Right, I see. And so, uh, I guess putting it into practice, there will be certain distinguishing features on the scripting. So, what are some of those, and how would that potentially be removed if, if you, uh, as you were mentioning? Yeah, I'm. I mean, the the script that we made is not a standard script. It's just something that we we created to service this this need. And um, it's basically a script that is kind of a, a simplified version of like a, a HTLC script that uh, for the normal payments on the Lightning Network. Um, and uh, actually, Lightning transactions have a similar problem. If they can't complete offline, if they can't or off chain, if they can't complete off chain, then they'll fall back onto the chain. And once they're on the chain, they uh, Lightning transactions also have a similar privacy problem because people can see how much that value was. People can see what the hash was. They can see the pre-image. So um, you don't want things to go onto the chain in that case, but they could. Um, And in Submarine Swap's case, we always go onto the chain. Um, It's like the failure case every time. And that's also the solution, though, is that we want to maybe become more like channels and say we have this hidden uh, backup script that could go to the chain. And then we don't use that all the time. We only use that if there's an uncooperative case, just like we do that in Lightning. Right, yeah. And it might be good to talk that through, actually, just, I guess, the operation of the submarine swap. So as I understand it, there's a success pathway where, as we mentioned, all those stuff we mentioned before happens. But then there's the failure mode where if somebody... I'm getting stuck here. So can can you help us? Can you help articulate that failure pathway? Yeah. Uh, Actually, this is one of the good things about submarine swaps is that they're... um, they're like a simplified version of the lightning lightning scripts. And the lightning scripts are, are, are based on this high-level concept called HTLC. And HTLC has uh, only two outcomes. So a normal payment that you would make has one outcome, which is uh, I've locked this script to, the, to a public key. And then 
the outcome is I see a signature associated with that public key, and then I say, okay, it's good to go. In the uh, HTLC contract, it's a bit different. There's two different conditions which can uh, be used for spending. And one of those conditions is I see a pre-image that corresponds to a hash, or I see a lock time that means that this, that this trade didn't happen and it's now timed out. Um, although due to the nature of Bitcoin scripting, you can't have exclusive operations. So um, even if you've hit the timeout, um, the uh, pre-image, the, the secret reveal could still also technically be used, um, which forces all of these swaps to, um, they, need, they need to be resolved. So um, they need to be swept out of that output and moved into like the single key control. Gotcha. Okay. And then, so that's that, basically, that's the way of making it such that you can use these submarine swaps in the atomic way rather than accidentally like losing uh, on-chain fees and losing on off-chain balance. Right. I mean, it it's the principle of the Lightning Network where you have this like window of time where if we reveal the secret, then the funds would transfer. And if the secret is never revealed, then you'll get your money back. So then let's talk a little bit about just use of this loop in, loop out. How are you seeing that used today across the network? Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, we've only really released an API of loop in and loop out. Um, so the big step that we're working on is to try to get it integrated more into like an end user experience. And so far, I think we've seen the most traction like uh, as we expected on the loop out, which is I need to get, I have this problem that I need inbound liquidity. I need to be, be able to change my channel so that people can pay me. So loop out is a great way to do that. And it's non-custodial. So th that means that you could like build it into your API and you don't have to like worry about, oh, is, you know, am I spending too much? Or, you know, if something fails, like, am I going to lose my money? So it's also good for us. We don't have the support tickets. Like, you know, if something goes wrong, well, it's on the, it's on the chain. You're going to get your money back. Um, so I would say that loop, in, loop out has been uh, a big success. And then the things we're working on are to try to make it more user-friendly and to add a bit more features. Right. And so putting that into practice, I guess, just into an example, let's say I'm a merchant and I'm setting up online. I want to set up to take lightning payment, but I don't have any incoming channels or in in inbound capacity, let's say. That's where Loopout could come in and uh, play a role. And uh, perhaps that would help new merchants on board to the lightning network and have incoming capacity from the get-go. Yeah, I would say it's it's a tool in their toolbox. So and maybe not for the merchant themselves, but somebody who's making a merchant solution. Like if you were making an app to help people take payments with Lightning, um, one thing you can do is you can say, okay, how much inbound liquidity do I have? Well, I'm, I'm running low. Maybe, maybe I've done a bunch of sales or maybe I'm just getting started. And in that case, you, know, you don't have to really even involve the merchant in this. You can just say, okay, acquiring more inbound liquidity using Lightning Loop. And then in that circumstance, you've solved the problem for the merchant. They don't even have to worry about it. Uh, yeah, I guess you're right. It's, it might be more like a lightning provider or some kind of service provider who is doing that for the merchant, unless the merchant is really technical and wants to do all that stuff themselves. Like if they're a bit refill or if they're a, you know, if they're like a bit more into lightning themselves. Uh, well, that's the thing about being non-custodial. Like this can be in, inside of an open source project. So, you know, this can be like embedded in kind of an open source point of sale system and there, there's no need for uh, like depositing coins in an account or creating an account or anything. You just uh, use API and you don't worry about it. Yeah, it's really fascinating to think about. And then I guess maybe this is going into more like what are the business models around Lightning, but then presumably that service provider, so let's say this service provider is helping the merchant take Lightning payment, then their fees would have to account for the different fees that they are in turn paying. So they would have to pass that on to their merchant, right? So whether that's on-chain fees to do the loops, the loop outs for the merchant to have the incoming capacity. And let's say at the end of every day or every week, they would need to do another round to get a, to get a whole new fresh round of incoming capacity and send that Bitcoin payment back to the merchant on-chain so that they can obviously take payment and pay their own costs and so on. Yeah, I, I mean... I'd say like it's a, like a brand new field, so we, I, I don't know exactly how things will play out. Maybe they will there will be more service providers. Maybe people will want to you know run everything themselves. 
Um, so the good thing about having an, like a non-custodial API is it really fits into all these different scenarios. Um, although it does offer the most power for people who want to do everything themselves because you don't have to have a relationship with the company. Right, yeah. Uh, have you seen or heard of any cases of um, merchants? I guess you, you might have spoken to some people who are trying to set up lightning stores and so on. Have they had difficulty with you know using lightning payment or have you found they were able to work through these issues? I'd say that um, people who are well-known or you know, even just like making something exciting have no problems because as soon as you announce to everybody, like I'm doing a new store, I'm, I'm setting up a new exchange, you know, everybody is, is very anxious to forward more traffic to you. They're going to get paid fees and, you know, they're just going to have fun, like sending all that traffic your way. Um, I would say the challenge is more people who are kind of unknown. So somebody who's just setting up something like really for the very first time or people who are like experimenting with becoming a routing node, um, in those cases, you know, um, nobody knows that they're going to be forwarding traffic to you. So they're, they're more hesitant to assign capital in your direction. In that case, loop out is, has, has really, um, offered those people a way to get started. Fantastic. So, okay. So we've spoken a bit about submarine swaps. We've spoken a little bit about loop in and loop out. Let's talk a bit about hyperloop, which is another concept, a uh, thing that you're working on. Can you just give us an overview on that? Yeah. Uh, Hyperloop is something I'm very excited about. Um, and it really describes like a vision for Lightning Loop where we get more efficient about how we use chain space. Um, and in addition to the efficiency, uh, there's also better privacy that, that falls out of that. And um, the high level concept of Hyperloop is that when you do significant volume in your chain transactions, you get this benefit, which people call batching. And the idea of batching is that you are concentrating the bytes in your transaction on the elements of the transaction that you want to really be uh, achieved. And you're spending fewer bytes on the parts of your transaction that you yourself don't care about, but everybody else needs to see like the signature. So, um, those savings can be very, very significant. Um, and the exciting thing about Hyperloop is that we can do something similar to batching. Um, and batching is already widely used on exchanges. Um, but we can use, do something similar to batching that can be done in a non-custodial way. And that we can do it in a way where um, multiple parties who may not have enough volume themselves to do batching can all come together and cooperatively do this batching. Um, so that's kind of a long-term vision that w where we would do these these major batches, and a batch, um, like you have to kind of understand like what the bytes are associated with in a transaction to understand why batching is like efficient. Um, so I would say there's like four parts to a normal transaction. Um, you have your inputs, so you're 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 referencing your pass coin that you received, and you need to assign some bytes to say that pass coin, and then your uh, you need to prove that you are the owner of that pass coin. So you need to assign some bytes for the signature. And then you need to um, assign some bytes to say, where am I sending it to? Um, so kind of like the address, you need to encode that. You need to encode the value. And then the final component to a transaction is like the, um, the overflow. So whenever you spend a coin in Bitcoin, you need to create a change address. You need to send the, coin, the remainder of the coins back to yourself. So um, that's the fourth component. So in a batch transaction, you can eliminate all of the components except for the one that you, except for the address and the value that you're sending to. So you can get a very high efficiency in a theoretical scenario, so maybe 5x. So uh, and that would be represented to you as like a chain fee instead of $5, you spend $1. Right. Yeah. Okay. And uh, let's put that into some practical examples. I think you've spoken before about how that could be done. So, for example, you could do one on-chain payment to refill multiple channels at one time in a loop-in. Oh, well, th that's actually where we can get into even more savings. So, because of multipath payments, um, you can say, I'm going to, like, let's say I'm a merchant and uh, I've been receiving um, funds from across 10 different channels. Um, and I've, I've received so many funds in all of these different channels. And 
Now I, I need to take that money and send it to an exchange. And the exchange is only accepting an on-chain settlement. Um, so what I want to get out is I want to get my money onto the exchange. And I also want to reset those channels so that I have inbound liquidity again. So what I can do is using multipath payments, I can spend down all of these different 10 channels at once with 10 off-chain transactions. And then they, because they're using the same hash and the same pre-image, they can be locked to one on-chain output. So we can get a 10x efficiency there. Um, and then the merchant, uh, the merchant gets what they want at, you know, even without like batching transactions, just by batching those off chain transactions, we can see a huge amount of savings. That's really fascinating to think about because it's just such a massive, massive saving because, you know, any merchant, if they're like, imagine in the future, they've got lots of different channels and they're able to just massively, uh, replenish or take, uh, get the balance in the channel back in their favor that they want it in. Uh, for a, for a fraction of the price that it would have cost before. Yeah, I mean, it's just more about being like more efficient with the chain space. So, I mean, an alternative could be that you would splice these channels. So you would say, I'm going to like splice out the difference. But when you did the splicing, you would have to deal with 10 inputs because there's 10 channels and that would, you know, cost you 10 times as much. So uh, what we're trying to do is just offer the most amount of options to you about how you can avoid paying the highest fee and do it in a way that's that it's like an API so it can kind of just automatically figure out what's the best way to, you know, do what I want to do. Got it. And so let's think about it, I guess, the other way. So that's in the merchant example. Are there any examples the other way around, like in a loop in scenario? Could that be like uh, an exchange wants to, let's say there's 10 customers of an exchange. Would that Would it work? like that as well yeah yeah for sure um and the same principle just in reverse so what what would happen is um let's say i'm a mobile wallet and i don't have just one channel because i want some redundancy i want like a few different routing nodes so uh i've assigned my capital to all these different routing nodes and um but i've spent everything down and we want people to use those channels efficiently so you could do three different loop ins to, to refill all those channels, or you could just share the same payment hash, same secret, um, with one on-chain transaction and using multipath payments, you could refill all of those different channels just in one shot. And the same thing also like versus splicing, um, you can get, you know, more efficiency because you're just using this one on-chain transaction. It's really mind blowing. Hey, I'm trying to, I'm struggling to keep up with you, Alex, but I, I guess in terms of what's needed to get there. So I guess, uh, obviously AMP, Atomic Multipath Payments. And I know in uh, L&D 0.8, there was some work done on per HTLC uh, invoice tracking, which I think is like a precursor, if you will, to ha having AMP. What other things are needed before we could get to that vision? Yeah, I mean, I would say also the Loop project in general is a great way for us to play around with multipath payments and realizing the benefits of multipath payments before they maybe become part of a full standard across the network. So um, one thing that we've been doing in um, working on L&D is preparing for the, to change how the APIs work and change how the protocol works to set ourselves up for the way that we've, we've thought about how to implement multipath payments. And uh, multipath payments, like there's lots of different ways to do this in the protocol. So um, there's been a bunch of debate, um, all the different implementations have come up with different ideas. Um, so the first stage is um, we're going to change the protocol to be more flexible. So the, that's something that that's, that's, that's already come in, in 0 0.8. Um, the ability to kind of, um, negotiate how many different shards of the payment they're going to be. Um, so give us a framework so that we can describe those types of things. And we've also started to change the APIs in L and D where, um, you can now see the different HTLCs that are attached to a single payment because in the current, in the previous versions of LND, like one payment hash, one HTLC was mapped to one payment. But in this future world of multipath payments, there's going to be multiple HTLCs that are all locked to the same payment. So we need to think about how to represent that in the data model. Um, and that's been released in 0 0.8. And then as we go forward, we will start to have more kind of proof of concept versions of multipath payments that people can maybe play around with in an experimental way. Gotcha. And I think the other thing that's coming, the other question that comes to my mind just now is this question of interoperability. So let's say in the Lightning future, there's obviously there's different Lightning implementations. Would this vision of, 
you know, one on-chain payment to refill five channels or that kind of thing, would that work? Presumably that would work across uh, software as well, right? L&D and maybe some of those people are using C-Lightning, some of them are on Eclair. Would the, I, I presume that's, uh, that's, that's essentially what you're building towards there. Sure. Like, the thing about Lightning payments is you have no idea, you know, where it's coming from. You just see a payment arrive. So I've even, you know, tested myself C Lightning with Lightning Loop. Um, there's, you know, no distinction from the server side about how it's getting that payment. Um, you know, obviously we're more familiar with L and D, um, so we've been building stuff that that work with works with L and D. But of course, it could be done with with C Lightning or with Eclair. And um, the other thing that's interesting about doing multipath payments with Lightning Loop is the way that we're um, implementing uh, atomic multipath payments in this initial stage is that they are not atomic. So um, let's say that you're receiving $10, but you're receiving it in two parts of $5. Um, in the initial version of multipath payments, you'll be able to take $5. You'll be able to take half the payment. So you can say, oh, well, the full $10 didn't show up, but I'm going to take $5 anyway. Um, and in the, few, the full version of atomic multipath payments that we you know want to get in, ultimately, you won't be able to do that. Um, but in the case of a submarine swap, it really makes no sense for you to take part of the payment because you have already locked on chain the full amount. So if you took the part of the payment, you would just be losing out money to yourself. The other side of the party already has this contract for the full amount. So as soon as you took that $5, they'd be able to take $10 from you. So this makes it like actually um, much stronger in terms of guarantees versus paying somebody $10 for lunch and then they take five dollars, and then you have to dispute with them. Um, this is, you know, a very well-bounded problem where it, it really just makes absolutely zero sense for you to take for you to take like part of the payment. Right. Yeah. And I think some of that also plays into that idea of uh, economic. Uh, yeah. Some of that plays into like multi-path routing and uh, only passing it on forward once you've received enough to account for that. So if there were two five-dollar payments incoming before you pass on your ten dollar payment to the final destination let's say yeah there's an economic part of this i mean even in in the lightning network itself like you need to be economically incentivized to forward an htlc i mean you could technically not do that but you should probably do it just to save yourself money right yeah and presumably as well there's fees you know that you will get for routing it so that's your incentive right 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 um and that's like a market process. Yeah. Okay. Um, also keen to ask, I know Connor from Next from the team has been working on this as well with 2P ECDSA. Could you give us a bit of an overview? What is that and how does that relate with Lightning? So I wouldn't say that we're actively working on it for like a, a really soon release. But the thing that we really want to do um, with channels is that we want to reduce the amount of money that you pay to make a channel. And we want to reduce the privacy footprint of a channel. And so um, the cost associated with a channel is that you, when you close it, you need to do this uh, multi-party signature, which means you need the signatures on the chain from both parties, and you have to pay for both signatures. Um, and then once you reveal those signatures to the chain, it looks very much like a channel close because you can see, oh, why is this two of two sending money somewhere? It could be a channel. So with two-party ECDSA, um, it allows you to fold in multiple signatures into one signature. And that has that advantage that you it now looks like any other payment. You couldn't even distinguish like what the, the difference between a channel transaction and a regular payment. Um, so that gives you a lot better privacy. And then you also pay the same amount. You don't pay any like increase for doing multi-sig. Um, and... That's not something that we have in production. We have like a working version. So Connor has, you know, created this open source version uh, in Go of a two-party ECDSA, and it it has the advantage that it works right now on the on the existing chain. You don't need a soft fork or anything, and um, it has the advantage that you know you you can you can you can do it right now, and you can make a multi-sig transaction, but you can save that one signature. Um, I'd say if you want a production code, um, there's a company called Zengo. Um, which is, you know, actually has a wallet you can download for your iPhone that that uses a similar technology with ECDSA. Um, so work is being done, you know, outside of what we're working on. Um, and and the the thing though that we're really thinking about is we have a lot of problems to solve in Lightning, and this is just one of them. 
and things will get a lot easier with the uh, Schnorr Taproot uh, soft fork. So um, this is kind of like the backup plan for if that just takes too long or if there's problems with that. Gotcha. And so could you just outline for us what the difference is then with the Schnorr Taproot soft fork into what the on-chain uh, transactions will look like for Lightning. So uh, uh, one example I'm getting at here is like that idea that a Lightning channel open and close are more distinguishable on the chain, whereas, uh, as I understand, with Schnorr and Taproot, some of the differences between these single signature payments and a Lightning channel open and close may uh, look more indistinguishable. Yeah, Um well, so it's not just the Schnorr taproot that makes it more indistinguishable. Um, actually, initially, it will make it much more distinguishable. Like, let's say that Schnorr taproot comes out and the people who upgrade are all the Lightning people. Then you'll be able to tell pretty easily. Um, and that's something that was is being addressed in the Schnorr taproot soft fork just for the long term. But in the short term, that'll be an issue. Um, so the thing that really helps us in terms of making the um, payments, the the the, the channel transactions look like regular on-chain normal transactions is this uh, concept called Musig, which is like unlocked with Schnorr because um, it's based on Schnorr. And Musig and two-party two ECDSA are pretty similar. Um, and the exciting thing about these, this concept as well is that we can do um, more than just two-party. We can actually have many, many parties involved in a transaction. Um, initially, as long as it's just um, everybody cosigns, you can have, you know, virtually like basically unlimited numbers of people um, all sharing that same sig signature, um, which I think is pretty exciting. And then there's also being work done on creating different thresholds of signers. So you could have like three of five. With the multi-signature part of it, that's, as I understand it, that uh, so the people are clear or very careful to establish that difference between I think I've heard it des described as key aggregation, not as sign signature aggregation. Or I think uh, Peter Villa has explained it as uh, he's. I think he's careful to say it's not cross input aggregation. It's only it's only in relation to one input that you can uh, aggregate. Correct. Right. Right. I mean, there's lots of different like scenarios, and um, one of the most exciting scenarios is that, uh, especially like if we want to do hyperloop with loop in is that you could potentially take many, many different uh, spent out UTXOs and have one signature across lots and lots of different UTXOs that is that is just shared throughout the entire transaction. And that's not something that we will have. So, you know, you don't want to get people too excited about this. E even though it's a known possibility that we could do it, we won't have that. So what we will have... And the same thing also with threshold signatures. We won't, you know, we're still, people are still working on those kind of constructions. So the thing to really expect in, in the shorter term is just this aggregation between uh, everybody is, is co-signing. There's nobody, you know, there's no threshold there. There's just everybody signs together. And yeah, I, I, I would like limit your expectations. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure people are getting the right idea on that because I think there were some there was some discussion that I saw that I was getting a little overly bullish, if you will. Um, well, yeah, something. I mean, some interesting things that you can do is is that like we have signatures in the Lightning Channel Graph. So every time you publish like information about your fees and stuff on Lightning, we have a peer to peer network on Lightning that spreads out all of these signed you know, policy statements of my fees. Um, so one thing we could do with signature aggregation is instead of having everybody in who's has these fees all represent their signature, we could collapse all those signatures into one signature. So, and, and signatures are big, right? They're, a, they're a big component of the data that's synced across the network. So we can make things a lot more efficient. Yeah, right. There's a lot to take in there. And I, I, I maybe slightly changing topic a little bit, but around this concept of fees and mining, did you have any comments around what that would do from a, you know, mining, uh, the amount of fees that miners would receive? Uh, but I suppose, would your thought be that if we're able to do all this stuff so much more efficiently, we'll just see so much more use of Bitcoin and Lightning such that miner fees won't uh, drop that much? What's your view? Um, I, I would say it, it, there is some kind of competition there. There's a competition between uh, external settlement and the blockchain is settlement. So, you know, the, the, the more efficient, the better that we've, we can make going out of the chain, 
well than the, the lower price that the chain can can demand. Um, but by the same token, if we're making you know the Bitcoin economy as a whole much more useful, um, then we're growing the pie. Um, you know, we're bypassing those limits to growth, and um, you know, even if this is like not something that we can really control, we can't control this economy. So um, all that we can do is kind of like get to the end game faster. And hopefully, once we get there, we're going to have enough fees to pay for proof of work. Uh, you know, um, I think we're we're doing great at, at the moment, and we still have you know a decade maybe of pretty okay fees. But um, it definitely is something to think about. Yeah, really interesting stuff. Um, let's. Uh, so I think was there anything else you wanted to mention around uh, Hyperloop, or should we uh, discuss a little bit about Lightning and business models? Um, well, just like. Um, to go outside of the lightning sphere, like I think Hyperloop ultimately could be good for people who even have nothing to do with the lightning network itself. Oh yeah. Um, that, you know, there's all of this, these fees that are being, being paid to make on-chain transactions. And, you know, that's kind of the economy that's been built up over the past 10 years. Um, and with lightning network, we're really creating a totally new economy. It's going to take time to bootstrap all that to, for people to figure out that market. Um, so one thing I really like with Hyperloop is the idea that you don't even need to really be involved with Lightning Network at all to you to get the benefit here because the benefit straight like the straight benefit to you is you get cheaper chain transactions. So even if you didn't really care about the Lightning Network, you could just use that to get cheaper chain transactions. Right. Yeah. And it, it, for some people, they may eventually end up using a service that uh, is able to be cheaper because they're able to use some of these features to reduce their own on-chain footprint, if you will, and therefore lower their own fee usage. Um, speaking of fees, I know recently Rusty did an email on the Lightning Dev mailing list about potentially raising the default fees. Do you have any views there on what, uh, what the fee situation is within the Lightning world and whether fees should be higher by default? Well, like I've resisted calling it a default because... It's not that the, like sometimes you have software and you install it and then it has all sorts of settings that are supposed to be good. But in the case of uh, L&D, the approach that's been taken is that we don't exactly know what the, what the fees should be. So we're, we're leaving that to the operator. It's kind of like in Bitcoin Core, we don't have this idea like you should pay a certain on-chain fee. Like that could be a solution maybe like, oh, we need to we need to get enough fees to pay for proof of work. So why don't we just have the core developers set a minimum relay fee that's equal to, <laughs> you know, a dollar or something. <laughs> and I mean, then you'd have this problem though where um, maybe that's not the right value. So you have to adjust that value. And um, I think one approach that's been taken in L&D is like, not setting default. So, um, but of course you need to have some value that's there at the start. Um, that's why like, it's difficult to say if it's a default or not a default. I do think that Rusty's totally right that you need to actually think about these values. Um, and like just setting it to what you get out of the box. Um, if you want to be a good router, um, you're not going to have, you're not going to be a good router out of the box with the, the initial, initial set of values. Um, I don't think that it's so simple that we can just set a rate and it's a market process. We need people to be figuring this out. And in order to make it better, we need to create tools that make it easier for people to adjust their rates to what they feel comfortable with and give them that information. Got it. And I, I, I think one thing, if you're listening in your, uh, routing, node operator out there you might be thinking well i'm not sure what is going to get developed and come into lightning and that might in turn influence my own fee decision of what i set as my fees because let's say amp comes in in a year or two years then that might change the way i set up my channels uh, i guess that might be something that has to get shaken out in terms of uh who's setting up what service, if, if you're running an LSP, a lightning service provider, or if you're a routing node, or if you're a merchant trying to sell things using lightning, I guess they all sort of play into your decision on w what sort of fee are you setting? Um, I mean, I'd be happy if people just gave some thought to their fees, because one thing that I think has been a problem is that people are not really considering their routing nodes to be a business. 
And since they're not a business, they're not reacting to market conditions. And so the service of a lot of routing nodes is subpar. Um, so I think the you know, before we worry about AMP, before we worry about all these technologies, we need to really think about how do we get these people to understand that they're offering a ser- a paid service to people. They're, they're supposed to be making money. Um, and that's just something that like we need to figure out. Yeah, gotcha. And so they would need to start considering the different costs associated with running you know it's a hot wallet there's a risk associated for that you're you know you're paying um chain you you potentially are ri- risking paying chain fees if your channel partner uh, let's say opens a channel to you and you, you know or if they they go stale there's all these sort of risks I, I suppose and because of that they would need to dial their fee settings appropriately to account for that such that they are then profitable as a routing node yeah i mean it's just like any other business so you have a certain set of costs and you have a certain amount of revenue and you need to make sure that like you're keeping a handle on your costs um i would say that as far as features go we want to offer more tools to people um and there's some things that maybe even need to be changed in the protocol like um one thing that i think is is weird is that we don't have we don't have a pairwise market so um you know if you set your fees you can set different fees for different destinations but you cannot set different fees for different sources so if i have a source one source who is like a mobile node who is not is not giving me routable liquidity and i have another source which is a routing node who i have full full utility of my of my money there i have to give them the same rate um, because it's just impossible in the current fee schedule and the current protocol to give multiple rates for multiple people. And there's good reasons why you can't do that. But um, because we have these limitations, it creates, you know, less uh, movement for market actors to to create, you know, great fees. Right. And let, let's just walk through that example a little bit. So let's say the mobile node is connecting to uh, uh, the lightning routing node in this example. And I guess the problem in this case, problem, quote, quote, quotation marks, is that this mobile routing node is likely, well, is not going to be routing payments any beyond, further beyond themselves. They're just paying through this lightning node uh, guy. And that is inferior from this lightning node guy's perspective because he would rather have a channel with another routing peer because that guy, so the money moving through that channel is much more free in some sense because it, he could use it uh, routing his own his own payments through well i don't know if i would like say if they're like inferior i would say that it's like different right so the like the the pro of having like this mobile wallet is maybe this guy is a spender yeah you need so to you have spenders to, to give you fees but the downside is the more that he spends the more capital like piles up on your side and like if it's a mobile wallet by default i would imagine all of their channels are private so even if you wanted to like send that money out somewhere else on the network, you wouldn't know how to get it there because the channels are private. So if you had another peer who's a routing node, you know, all their channels are public. If money stacks up on your side, you could say, oh, well, I can use that money to push it out to an exchange or something. So it's just like that. there's these different types of liquidity. And as a routing node operator, you're a little bit uh, constrained and that you can't you have to treat them as equals. Gotcha. And so th- I guess that also places some importance on your position within the within the Lightning Network graph, if you will. Can you comment a little bit on how to think about that and how to position for that? Yeah, I mean, you could also think about it like as if there's two different roles of routing nodes. So there's a routing node who uh, kind of is a provider for people who are on the edges, like the, these mobile wallets. And that's kind of what they specialize in. Um, and because we have this like system where you have this one fee rate from anybody who is coming to you, that's like a way around to work around this problem. You could just say all of my, all of my peers are mobile clients. So it makes sense that I charge them all the same rate. Um, there's another way that you could, you could, um, operate your node and that's to operate as you only connect different, uh, other always online nodes, other public channel nodes together. And so you could be maybe the interior of the network. Um, And that comes with the different operational requirements. So if you're on the edges of the network, you need to be, you you need to be okay with your capital, maybe being offline, being unroutable. Um, If you're in the middle of the network, maybe your capital needs to be, um, your capital requirements are lower. 
Um, so, you know, that's just something that like needs to kind of play out in terms of like business specialization. Yeah. Really interesting to think about, though. Uh, and what about another one? Channel acceptance policy. So one quick example. I know, I know, Bit Refill will actually reject your channel unless it's I think zero point four BTC or something like that because they want only the big channels, right? And so that's another thing that may come to lightning as well of having more specific uh, policies on which you accept or reject yeah, an incoming yeah. channel. Actually, that is a feature already now in zero point eight. So 0.8, I mean, which was just released, uh, allows you to set an arbitrary policy. So, you know, whatever kind of criteria you want to enforce. Um, and one example I talked about is um, maybe you don't want all these tiny channels. And that's something that I also enforce on my nodes. I don't want these small channels. Um, because, you know, people are still learning how Lightning works. And a lot of times people are like, I'll make a channel for the full amount of money that I want to spend on my channel. And then it will only get one payment and you won't get the, the aggregation benefits. Um, so I set a minimum channel size to kind of uh, reinforce this idea that this is a, this channels are things that you're reusing, and, and that and the reason you're reusing it is because that gives you more chain efficiency and lower lower cost. Um, so uh, as an alternative to this policy, which just says you pony up four hundred dollars or you get lost, you could say, well, I will accept you at a lower at a lower um, amount of money if you um, push some funds over to my side to kind of like make it worth my while. So you could say um, either they put up $400 or they put up $20, but then they send me 50 cents. So and, and that those criteria are completely up to the operator now. Right. And then how does that get negotiated between the different clients? So let's say let's say you, in that example, you're running LND 0.8. I'm running LND 0.8 and you want to put in a policy to say, Stefan, if you want to open a channel to me for $20, I want 50 cents. How would I get notified of that would it would i would i see an error message saying oh alex has rejected your channel he wants you to put 50 cents in on his side of the channel or how would that work uh i think that is, is like a would be a, an obvious easy flow but unfortunately in 0 0.8 that was like a still an outstanding issue of customizing the message that gets sent back so in the current release you'd have to somehow out of band kind of signal to the person that this is what your requirements are because the current message is just it failed um, I've made an issue on the LND repository to allow you to customize that message. And, you know, if people, if, if more use does come out of this, we could formalize it into more of a protocol that says, you know, here are the conditions. And that's something also we've thought about just at a high level, um, just communicating your, your channel policies, um, in some way that's synced just like all the graph data. So I'm this node and here's the type of channels that I want. Hmm. One other question I was keen to ask you about is uh, stock payments. So as I understand, that's one potential area where Lightning payment user experience uh, might be a little tricky to it right now because, for example, you might uh, scan the QR, you might pay it, and then you're waiting and you don't know if it's gone through. And then if that user got impatient and then just said, oh, screw it, I'll, just, I'll try with another wallet, at that point they might have accidentally double paid the invoice how uh, are you thinking through that issue and what are some ways to deal with that um yeah that is a, a you know a big uh an issue where we have lots of different ways that we can address it um and also it's an outstanding issue so in the current lnd if you hit um one of these stuck paint you know a stuck hop um you will potentially run into problems i don't think it's like a current major issue that people are seeing um it used to be more in the past, you know, not because of any nefarious nodes, but just because the uh, protocol wasn't as solid as it is now. Like all of the implementations were kind of learning to work together. Um, and in the current in the current network, I think we rarely ever see these stuck payments. Um, but of course, it's a possibility. Um, I think in uh, that's something that Yoast is working on, um, and that we have in kind of a test mode at the moment of a model to deal with stuck payments and not just stuck payments um, or delayed payments. Like why is my payment taking a while to get there? Um, so, you know, we're working on a combination of pathfinding solutions to try to like make it um, responsive to those situations. Um, we're also making um, it uh, like the different modes of paying. So uh, one way that you can kind of avoid stuck payments is that, you can take a look at the route that you're going to use. And before you actually commit all your money to the actual um, payment, 
you send a test payment through. And the test payment can be very small. But like a it, probing sort of amount or whatever. Exactly, like a probe. And uh, if you, you know, don't hear back from this probe, you can say, well, that route, you know, there's something wrong with it. Um, and if you do hear back really, really quickly and easily, then you can say, well, you know, I did. And, and that payment, of course, can still get stuck. But if you're just sending like a penny or something, like if it gets stuck, it's not a big no problem. Big deal, yeah. And the other thing about a probe is the probe can never resolve in you losing your money. Because it's the probe is sending to a payment hash that's a fake payment hash. It's just a random number. So nobody has the secret that corresponds to that hash. So nobody could take that money. Um, so it's a lot lower risk. Um, so one model that I also use, like when I make payments, is I first send a fake payment hash to the same destination that I intend to pay. Then if that succeeds, I take the same route that just succeeded with a fake payment hash and I got a good signature from the destination and I can say, okay, now I'm going to send using the real amount of money in the real payment hash. I guess one question that strikes me there is using a fake payment hash in that scenario, is that still locking up HDLCs along the route? Um, yeah. I mean, from the perspective of the network, it has no idea that there's anything different. Right. Yeah. So it just, it might lock up a few sats along each hop on that route, um, but fundamentally I mean, depending on how much really... you want to probe. Yeah. So the reason you would want to probe with a lower amount is just, you know, if it does get stuck, well, you've only stuck up, you've only stuck like a, a penny. Um, you might want to want to try the full amount. Um, and in that case, then you can you can get stuck with a full amount. Okay, cool. Um, look, so we're coming to time, but I think uh, probably just a final question. What are you most excited about for Lightning over the next, let's say, a year or two? Well, the thing that I really you know, want to see happen is to take all of these amazing tools that we are making um, on the implementation side of things and like create amazing services that really take full advantage of them. Um, so, uh, you know, I know a lot of companies have just received funding for building these, building out these new services. And I think we're still in kind of the mode of like, why don't I just take what I was doing with Bitcoin before and just like kind of map it into the lightning world. But what I really think could be cool is like totally new possibilities that are open up with Lightning and, you know, just were never possible with on-chain transaction flows. Yeah, that's a good way to leave it. Alex, just for the listeners, I, I guess most of them probably already know where to find you, but uh, Alex Bosworth on Twitter, uh, lightning.engineering, is it? Uh, where, where else can people find you? Um, yeah, I definitely, um, I try to post regularly, you know, create content every day on Twitter. Um and then uh, on the Lightning Slack, the Lightning Community Slack, I think is a great resource to like have kind of back and forth com conversations. And if you are developing on Lightning, it's a great way to reach out to other people. Um, there's always some people there who can kind of help you get started. Fantastic. Well, thank you for joining me, Alex. Oh, it was it's great to be on the podcast. Reminder, if you find the show educational, make sure you give it an iTunes review and share it with your friends and family. The show notes and the transcript are at stefanlevera.com. Thanks for listening, and I will see you in the Citadels.